The Pest and Predator podcast is brought to you by Field Heroes, powered by the Western Grains Research Foundation. Visit fieldheroes.ca to learn how beneficial insects can benefit your farm. Welcome to the Pest and Predator podcast featuring interviews with entomologists from across the prairies. I'm your host, Sean Haney of Real Agriculture and Real Ag Radio on Rural Radio 147, Sirius XM. We're going to talk to a number of entomologists through the Pest and Predator podcast. They've got the latest information on pests that you may encounter in your fields and the beneficial insects that help to control them. Today's guest on the Pest and Predator podcast is Dr. Megan Venkoski. She's a research scientist in field crop entomology at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada in Saskatoon. Here's my conversation with Dr. Venkoski. Dr. Venkoski, welcome to the Pest and Predator podcast. How are you doing today? I'm well, thanks. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. So we're going to talk today about the pea leaf weevil and how possibly we support beneficial insects uh, in terms of this insect. So start off, tell me about the pea leaf weevil. Why is it a pest? Well, the pea leaf weevil is actually invasive to Western Canada, and it is a pest of field peas and faba beans. And one of the reasons why it can be considered quite a significant pest is because the larval stage damaged the root nodules of their host plants that fix nitrogen. And so we often like to grow pulses in our crop rotations in order to improve soil nitrogen naturally. And the pea leaf weevil cancels out that beneficial effect of growing pulses because they destroy those root nodules and then the plants cannot produce their own nitrogen. So overall, we can see a loss of yield, um, but also a loss of some of those other great benefits of planting pulses in our crop rotation. So what does it look like? Well, the weevil itself is kind of a brown gray color with stripes on its back. It's only a few millimeters long, three to four at most. Um, and, and unlike most weevils that have quite long noses, uh, the pea leaf weevil is a broad-nosed weevil, so it has a very blunt nose. Um, but its antennae are still attached to its face at about where its nose is. Um, so all other weevils that have longer noses, their antennae actually come off the ends of their noses, which I personally think is very cool. Um, the pea leaf weevil is a little bit different because of that broad nose but it's still a weevil and, and very cool. In the growing season, how many, how many cycles do we get from the pea leaf weevil? Uh, this is a pest that only has one generation per year. So in the spring, we will see adult weevils that emerge from overwintering sites, and then they move into the crops in the spring and start feeding on their host plants, um, peas or faba beans. At that time, they'll mate and start laying eggs, and the eggs, they can actually, the adults will live quite a long time. So that generation that emerges in the spring can still be found in the field in July and August. And they can lay a lot of eggs during that period of time, which again is a reason why they're a pest. Um, but we'll start to see the new generation of adult weevils begin to emerge in late July and early August. And then they'll basically feed on anything green and then enter their overwintering as that new generation of adults. So one generation per year, but the adults from the two generations can overlap depending on how well that first generation survives. So if not controlled through insecticide or beneficial insects, what, what kind of impact can it have? Well, I think it can be quite variable and it really depends on the population density. So if you have a low population density in the field, probably not going to have any substantial or noticeable impact on nitrogen fixation or yield um, or any economic um, effects. But if the weevils occur in really high numbers, really early in the growing season especially, then they can be a more significant threat to crops. And so we see numbers in the field and other places where pea leaf weevil are active looking at say a 10 to 30% yield loss um, if the populations are significant enough. And because we're just not going out to just spray an insecticide just because we need to do some scouting, when and how do you scout for the pea leaf weevil? Well, this is actually a little bit of a disconnect and, and something that we really need to work on better. And so right now we scout for pea leaf weevil 
early in the spring when our plants are at the two to th- two to six node stage, um, especially for field peas. So the Prairie Pest Monitoring Network actually conducts an annual survey for pea leaf weevil, and our protocol is to go out when the plants are at that young stage and then count the feeding notches on the plants. The problem with that, though, is that the most effective insecticide option to manage the pea leaf weevil is a seed treatment. It has to go onto the seed before the seeds are planted and before we start scouting for weevils. So there are some foliar options. They are not nearly as effective as the seed treatments. Um, So this is where there's, again, like I said, a bit of a disconnect between when we're scouting to know what the population densities are and when we really should be scouting to know if we need to use insecticides or not. Um, So it's it's a work in progress. I'm assuming through beneficials there are some other possibilities here can i can i avoid a seed treatment or spraying altogether i think that it is possible um so one of the things that the prairie pest monitoring network does is we use the the damage that we see in our surveys that we conduct every year in the spring in order to produce a distribution map for pea leaf weevil populations and the accepted knowledge for pea leaf weevil management um, over the last few years has been that if you are farming field peas or faba bean in an area where pea leaf weevil densities are high, then it might be worth considering using an insecticide seed treatment. But if you live in an area where, or if you farm in an area where pea leaf weevil populations are very low, then it's not worth or probably not worth the money to invest in an insecticide seed treatment. So it really does depend on where the weevil is presently occurring in the highest population density. And and those maps are all available on the Prairie Pest Monitoring Network website. So can you tell me what beneficials have an impact on pea leaf weevil? Well, this is actually a work in progress. And so because it's an invasive invasive species, we really don't have all of the knowledge yet to know what are the specific beneficial insects that might be impacting pea leaf weevil. But we've done some work and and are addressing this question in a few different ways in some projects that are actually still ongoing. Um, Some of the work that I did during my master's research um, back in 2008 and 2009 was look at whether or not different sized beetles could eat pea leaf weevil eggs. And this was only a lab study, but we did find that small ground beetles of the um, genus Bambidian could eat pea leaf weevil eggs, whereas larger beetles that were at least a centimeter or longer couldn't eat the pea leaf weevil eggs because their mandibles were too big. So we know that small species of ground beetles and uh, and rove beetles actually could potentially be eating pea leaf weevil eggs in the field. But we don't know yet how much of an impact that has on their population. In terms of other stages of pea leaf weevil development, the larvae, the pupae, and the adults, there has been some work out of the United States that has shown that larger ground beetles like Terosticus melanarius can eat pea leaf weevil and will eat pea leaf weevil. So I actually partnered with Dr. Maya Evenden at the University of Alberta, and we have a graduate student who's looking to answer some of these questions. Which larger ground beetle species are eating pea leaf weevil, and what is their potential impact on pea leaf weevil populations? Such interesting stuff. Uh, you know, you, you talk, we talk about the circle of life all the time, <laughs> but it, it is amazing what is happening inside the canopy when it comes to these insects. Right. And and so I know one of the messages that Field Heroes has been communicating and that I also try to communicate is that not every insect that you encounter in your field is a pest. A lot of them are actually probably beneficial insects or neutral insects that just might be passing through. And so these these species are really important to conserve. And if we can avoid foliar sprays especially, then that's going to be a lot better for the agroecosystem as a whole um, than having to apply those foliar products. So when you're trying to find a, a beneficial for pea leaf weevil in this example, uh, 
And you said you're doing it, you know, you're doing the lab work. Are, are you, you're introducing a number of different potential predators for, for the pea leaf weevil and just seeing what the interaction is? And is there a parasitoid that will attack? Like, are you just kind of throwing everything at the pea leaf weevil in the lab to sort of sort out what the pecking order is? Kind of. So the way I did it and, and kind of the way that uh, our, our student is doing it is, is it's called a bioassay. And so the idea is, is that we set up kind of a small arena, either in a Petri dish or some kind of a plastic or other kind of container. And, and those can have varying levels of realism. So that they can be very simple, just basically be an empty container with a whole bunch of peely flevil eggs in it that we then introduce a predator to. And we give those predators some time and come back and then see if any of the eggs are gone. Um, so we, we like to try to do these. Usually we start simple. And, and so we have a simple container, a uh, very simple little environment that we introduce one predator at a time into. And then once we've learned what predators will eat the eggs or will eat the adults and which ones won't, then we can start looking at more complicated scenarios. Like will a small ground beetle get eaten by a large ground beetle when it's trying to eat the eggs. <laughs> mm. And so then we can add complexity to the system. We can use more complex um, environmental settings. Um, so like something like a cage out in the field or a dish that has soil and some plants growing in it. And then that we put the peely fluval into and then add the predators to. So it can be very simple or very complicated. And we can look at those interactions to ask, do these two different ground beetles work together to reduce peely fluval populations? Or do they actually work against each other? And do peely fluval escape control because the predators or the potential predators are just competing with each other? Mm. So there's, there's so many different questions we can ask. We can also look at this from a molecular standpoint. And so this is some of the work that our student at the U of A is doing. She's starting to do gut content analysis. So we're catching beetles in the field. We're getting them to basically throw up their lunch and then using molecular techniques to determine what they've been eating. So cool. Because they're only three millimeters big, right? And so doing starting out with field observation, it's not like you're studying, are there predators for a duck? And you can look at that duck and you can track it and you, you don't lose sight of it if you grab your lunch. These are like, we're talking about tiny, tiny pests here. So a very, very interesting stuff. Dr. Van Kosky, thank you so much for joining us here this episode of the Pest and Predator podcast. Well, you're very welcome. It's been a pleasure. Um, I hope that maybe this inspires some people to get interested in doing some studies on insects. I hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Pest and Predator podcast. It's brought to you by Field Heroes, powered by the Western Grains Research Foundation. Visit fieldheroes.ca to learn how beneficial insects can benefit your farm.